Al Sagala. I'm president of the Calaveras County Taxpayer Association and welcome to Taxpayer Alert. On this session our guest is Guy Puccio who has quite a varied experience. I met him on, well actually I served with him on the uh, Assessor's Appeal Board in Calaveras County and I'm amazed at how his knowledge of the law. But he also has knowledge of uh, real estate, uh, of the economy, and politics. So well, this is going to be a very interesting session. Now, we must say that uh, the Calaveras Taxpayer Association is not political. We do not support or oppose candidates, but we do discuss ideas, and we're welcome to hear new ideas. And so we do separate fact from opinion, and I think you'll enjoy this show. Guy, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Al. I, I have been around quite some time, and my background includes uh, being a real estate broker and an educator, I have uh, been a member, although not now, of a, a faculties of various community colleges. Also guest lectured at uh, Bolt Hall School of Law at University of California and also taught uh, at the California State University at Hayward. My subject areas are real property, real property secured transactions, meaning loans on real property, and securities where the investment vehicles are some form of real property or interest in real property. Uh, I am a, uh, a realtor, although my activities as a broker are generally focused on commercial transactions or exchanges uh, and, and working with counsel. I do a lot of work as a consultant, expert witness, and in addition to that have, have uh, served uh, as a commissioner, receiver, administrator, special master, and uh, I'm been in the past an advisory commissioner to the California Department of Real Estate, now the Bureau of Real Estate, and a consultant to them for almost uh, 30 years. Uh, and in that capacity, I've prepared a lot of the literature that they uh, publish, either as the principal author or editor, such as materials in their reference book on agency, finance, uh, escrow title, and booklets that they give out to the public. Well, do I, 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 perhaps the audience understands why I didn't attempt to memorize uh, his, his uh, bio, uh, because it's just too much for my little brain to hold. Now, I understand, uh, uh, Guy, that uh, you recently spoke on the topic of current crisis, uh, core conflicts, and freedom. What do you include in the term current crisis? There are a number of current crises, and I'm speaking in the political sense, in the economic sense. Uh, and also, I guess I should have said that I've also served as a legislative advocate, although not now contract uh, lobbyist. So I've had that experience at uh, the California State Capitol. The crises to which I'm referring include uh, the uh, amount of the national debt, which is $17 trillion. There is an additional sum of $9 trillion about which the public is t largely unaware of where the Federal Reserve Bank published or actually printed, uh, they didn't initially publish or inform the public about it, about $9 trillion to buy the worst of the subprime alternative or non-traditional mortgage products from those who had vest, invested into them, whether they were foreign or domestic investors. So that's a problem that's added on to the $17 trillion because of the inability to value those instruments. And then there is a, a growing amount of underfunded liability of about $94 trillion uh, for all of the programs, the entitlement programs, the uh, pensions, the benefits, et cetera, for civil and military uh, personnel. The actual total debt of the United States is $120 trillion at a minimum. 
Uh, there's only about 79 or 80 trillion in private hands in the way assets are measured today. So we're kind of upside down in that regard. The difficulty is, when I say current crisis, is, is that those who represent either party, it's not unique to one versus the other, will suggest, using the word that I heard used in your previous program about sustainability, oh, that the debt is sustainable and we can survive the next 10 years. The point is, that's not quite the truth. What is the truth is the only way that we can sustain and survive with the debt that we have for any prolonged period of time is for the Federal Reserve to keep monetarizing the debt keep the in, and keeping the interest rates low. What the Federal Reserve is doing is printing about $84 trillion every 28 days called quantitative easing. It's one, two, three, four. We're in four now. That amount, when multiplied uh, by the number of, of components within a year, if you take uh, 28 and divide it by th you know, 365, you'll end up with 13. Multiply 84 times 13, you got 1.2 trillion. So what they're doing is printing money adequately to cover the amount of uh, annual deficit, the average amount of annual deficit, although all that money isn't being used to buy treasuries. It is being used to either buy treasuries all short term or primarily short term and also mortgage-backed securities. If they stop quantitative easing, which they've hinted that they might do, meaning the Federal Reserve, when I say they, Federal Reserve Bank, then you're going to see a spike up of interest rates for a couple of reasons. The CPI index is reported at one, one and a half, two percent. The truth of the matter is that excludes fuel and food, all forms of energy, fuel, fuel and food. If you add those back in, it's really four, five, six percent per year, not one, one and a half or two percent. If they back off of quantitative easing, you're going to see uh, inflation slowly move right up to where it would otherwise be the four, five, six percent. That means treasuries go from not the one and a half to two percent that they're averaging now, which if you do the math, you will see that somewhere around 300 billion, 340 at the, the most, and a 250, 270 billion uh, at the minimum on the interest, the amount of interest on the national debt, that could jump easily to where it has historically. Interest on the debt has always been at least the true inflation rate plus 1%, that could easily jump to 5%. And if you take 5%, now that's 850 billion. Uh, that shows you how much of the federal expenditures could, in a short term, go from only 250 to 340 billion range to all of a sudden eight, 850, 900 billion. And when that happens, I can assure you the system cannot survive as we know it today, because the revenues are only 2.4 to 2.68 trillion, expected to maybe go as high as 2.9 trillion. Uh, that's too much uh, of the debt, or excuse me, too much of the expenditures and the revenues that we are sustaining at this point to survive. That's what I mean when I say a current crisis. All you do is stop quantitative easing, recognize the true inflation, inflation rate, and we're in a big mess. The other element of the current crisis is the fact that all that money, that capital that's being sucked up by the government, uh, is not available in the private sector uh, as capital, particularly for small to moderate businesses, and that slows down the private side, while at the same time the government side is growing. So if the gross national product, I think that's what you're talking about for private investing and productivity, um, if you have an increase of, uh, uh, say, a certain percentage, say 5% uh, increase in uh, GPI, uh, the gross national product, then uh, you could sustain 5% inflation because one would cancel the other out except for long-term liabilities, is that correct? That's correct, that's, that's a reasonable analysis. The difficulty is, is that the gross national product is not growing as fast as the deficit. Uh, I believe it's around 15, uh, 15 to 16 trillion, and it's expected to grow up to 20 trillion over the next few years, but then the debt, the national debt is expected to go to 20 to 22 trillion. So we're gonna be staying right even or at, or greater than the gross national uh, product or the gross domestic product is what it's called now, the GDP, 
gross domestic product. And part of the problem is a lot of that gross domestic product is coming more on the government side rather than the, the private side. And that's, that's uh, causing uh, difficulties too. And why we really face a very short term crisis, all we have to do is stop the government uh, through the Federal Reserve System monitorizing that huge government deficit and debt. So the only way out would be to reduce spending as low as you can and then constantly reduce spending each, each year till you have no uh, deficient and, and, or no deficit. And then, uh, then you will start to reduce the, uh, the, the national debt. Is that, am I looking at it correct? Well, what one would have to do, the idea of the sequester that is talked about so much was to reduce the amount of the increase. It didn't really reduce it from the, ba reduce it from the baseline, it's just the amount of the increase. One would have to at least do that and preferably uh, reduce the size of government, reduce the expenditures of government, and that is where we are at this point again with the argument going on nationally. The Ryan uh, plan, and it's going to be Congressman Ryan uh, from the House, and as I understand, Senator Murray from the Senate, who are going to meet in conference to talk about this. The Ryan budget cuts government by $4.6 trillion over the next decade. The Murray plan, which is a Democratic plan, uh, raises about $100 billion more in stimulus, throws on a $950 billion in new taxes, offset by $950 billion uh, of cuts. So the, that plan adds uh, sp expenditures matching the added taxes and actually goes above it by $100 billion, where the Ryan plan uh, cuts government by $4.6 trillion. But if you're going to cut government by $4.6 trillion, you've got to start cutting government programs. You have to take a look at all of the agencies and the federal bureaucracy, all the departments, and decide which of them are efficacious, which ones of them are not, which ones have gone well beyond their mission, and start cutting back on what the federal government is trying to do. That, I just thought of this. Do you remember the Grace Commission report? Yes. That uh, goes back a few years. A long time, yes. It seemed like, it seemed like well, what it was, uh, the private sector uh, paid for hiring experts to look at government for, it, it, for efficiency, not, with, not for purpose of government programs, just to do away with redundant uh, programs and such. And they found, the Grace uh, Commission report found a tremendous amount of savings, and, and, uh, but very little of it was implemented. And I wonder if, if we were able to do that now, have a new Grace Commission report, would we still have the problem of not being able to implement it? We might have a political problem of not being able to implement it, uh, but I think as a practical matter, we could and should. Uh, for example, the Congressional Budget Office says there is about $100 billion in wasted money, uh, waste pl plain, straight out waste every year in the federal budget. I suspect it's at least that or more. And there is somewhere between 160 and 180 uh, different social programs and entitlement programs that are many of which are duplicatory that could be reduced substantially uh, and that would start to pare down the size of expenditures. So bottom line, what we're really talking about is having a, a free society for our children and their children where they can live with security and happiness and, and, and prosperity. So if we don't do things right now, they would suffer uh, in not having a free society anymore and then maybe uh, maybe having very, very difficult times. Uh, I think that's fair, although I would uh, uh, describe it as not only our children or grandchildren, I believe, and even though you and I are up in years, uh, that we will see uh, serious changes taking place in the transformation of America uh, in our lifetimes. So it may not just be our children, our grandchildren. And the point of, of freedom, and that was part of my discussion, is because of the two different tracks that we seem to be going down. There are those of us who want to concentrate all of the power in a large federal government uh, that 
uh, together with it and its bureaucracy and those associated or affiliated with it, which typically are large academic institutions, community organizations, large unions, large corporations, large financial institutions, will decide how we live, uh, plan where we live, uh, what type of goods and services are to be produced and, and uh, delivered and sold or distributed and sold. That's one kind of vision. And the other vision is, no, it ought not to be government. Uh, and it doesn't have to be government ownership. Government control, that's still you know, as, as effective as ownership. And the other side says, no, it really ought to be government. You reduce your size, get out of the decision making. Uh, and return it to the people and let the people decide. It's sort of a bottom-up uh, description of society, individual choice, individual freedom, uh, individual uh, planning, uh, individual theology, individual education, all of that coming from the bottom-up as compared to the top-down. Those are the two conflicting views and why I call them core conflicts, because it's hard to reconcile. And on one hand, when you want to do everything top-down, and at the central government. Right. And on the other hand, you want to do everything bottom up. And I happen to be one of those who believes that government governs best when it governs least. Right. And government governs best when it governs closest to you. And the reason I believe in those two, uh, uh, two injunctives is because it is most responsive and responsible to when it's closest to you when it governs least, it is most transparent. And that's why the bottom up was designed by, I think, our founding fathers to be least and closest to you. And where the other uh, view is not least, it is the most and the furthest from you and the least transparent, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I understand that. I, I think our taxpayer group, uh, uh, certainly our board of directors, uh, really believes in limited government. and. We really support our Constitution, and we think our framers really had it right. And I think, um, to a certain extent, uh, we've forgotten some of the lessons that they taught us about uh, having respect for individual rights of life, liberty, and property, and that these rights were not given by government. The UN has a different approach to human rights, and they really call them privileges. But uh, if, if these human rights are come from the individual because of the nature of the individual, then it seems like uh, we need to have some fundamental change. We need to have more honesty in government, and we need to respect those rights of the people. Then the purpose of government would be to protect those rights. And uh, life would get a lot simpler if, if more people would see that as a truth. Yes, I, I would I tend to agree that uh, life would be more simple. Uh, I also um, uh, believe that uh, in the system that you just described, there would be a higher level of individual freedom. Yes. Whereas in the view that it should all come from the top down and that the planners are more informed and do a better job of deciding how a society should uh, live and, and proceed and how it should produce goods and services and distribute them, uh, you would have less freedom because they would be making the choices rather than the individuals making the choices. And that's where you get into the you know, sort of the core conflict and the distinctions between the two uh, very difficult views, uh, difficult disparate views to reconcile. Um, do you um, have, how, how have the conflicts uh, between the political interests been historically received? In other words, um, uh, what can we look to uh, coming ahead on the, on the future elections, uh, what's likely going to be our choices? Well, uh, that's a good question. One of the, the key statements that I remember a president saying many years ago by the name of John Kennedy was that politics is the art of that which is possible. Uh, also, when I, in my undergraduate work, studied uh, uh, political science, uh, in, in the the system that we developed from our founding, the theory was always that you would have the checks and balances of the two different houses, the Congress and the Senate, and then the president, and of course the fourth level of government being the judiciary, uh, and that conflicts between them as well as between interest groups, which we have developed into two major parties, although there seems to be other groups, uh, the independents and the libertarians, besides the Republicans and the Democrats, that those conflicts would not be cumulative. 
that there would be times that everybody could work together on common goals and should. Uh, that's what we need to sort of move towards. Um, a great illustration of that was Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, and another one was Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich. Uh, so you had both, you know, a Democrat and a Republican uh, presidents doing exactly what the founding fathers anticipated. Uh, and what happened there was uh, uh, President Reagan and, uh, got acquainted with Tip O'Neill, actually invited him to the White House. Be they became very friendly and worked together very well. They didn't always agree. They didn't end up with the same agendas by far, but uh, they didn't uh, go after each other. There was no demonization. There was no marginalization. Uh, there was no personal attacks or arguments at Hahnemann. They were just simply, let's try to work together and achieve common goals. Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton did the same. In fact, they got together. I recall watching them on an illustration to show the public how they could work together, actually did a, a uh, debate between them and a friendly discussion between them on television, showing how they would bargain back and forth. We need to get back to that. We I'm need to go back to working together, finding common agendas, and moving them forward, and moving away from the extremes of the agendas that appear to be operative today. It seems like in order to do that, there has to be some common ground. There has to be something that they each would agree to. If nothing else, where to set the thermostat. Yes. <laughs> it seems uh, when, you, when you have, a, you mentioned your core beliefs are so different, between the advocates of limited government and the advocates of more government, uh, how, I, I, so it's, it, you would have a dialogue and the, you, it's not likely that the results would be stagnation. It's likely that out of this dialogue, there'll be either an increase in government or a decrease in government. Uh, and it seems that to be the nature. I, I don't think it possible that uh, we could sustain the present level of government and still have our society uh, survive. So how can this process, looking ahead, you know, just considering the, the current actors on the stage, uh, how do you see uh, it unfolding? How, how, what's going to happen uh, assuming that there's no radical change. Well, I'm not sure I'd want to use the word radical change, but th that there would be no change. Or significant change. Yes, yeah, significant change may be a better way of <laughs> describing it. I am uh, one, one who believes that what we have to do is go back uh, to the notion of, of the checks and balance of, of uh, power and take away from the executive branch the expansive bureaucracy that it has developed since Franklin Delano Roosevelt didn't really exist before that time. It was in his era where uh, we began the notion of writing broad legislation and allowing executive branch uh, departments, agencies, uh, commissions decide what to do and write rules and regulations often beyond what was contemplated because what was contemplated wasn't clear and precise. Uh, if I could dictate, and nobody wants to be that, but if I could go to the legislature, the Congress and the Senate, and change them, the first change I would make is stop writing broad legislation. I want you to write exactly what you intend, which means a lot more detail, a lot more substance, and in more bills with limited subjects in each, not try these massive omnibus bills, as in the Affordable Health Care Act, which was over you know, was like, uh, 2,700 pages and now 20,000 pages of regulations. And they haven't read it. No, they they haven't, nobody's even read it. That's right. And the Dodd-Frank Act, which was misrepresented, in my opinion, is over 2,000 pages and 10,000 uh, regulations, 10,000 pages of regulation, and they're only 40% through. That's the type of legislation they should stop writing. They should write legislation that is focused on limited subjects and highly detailed and say to the bureaucracy, you implement that no more. Therefore, we the people, because we're represented by those senators and those House of Representative members, the Congress, uh, would then have the input uh, to them and we would keep the the, the size of government and the objectives of government and the agenda consistent with what 
we the people as citizens, not subjects. Yeah. That's the difference. Citizens want. Uh, in fact, my view is, is that an elected representative is a delegate of the constituents when the issues are clearly defined. That means you're supposed to do what your, your people want you to do that voted you in. And when, it, when it's not clearly defined, that the issue is not clearly defined, you then are their trustee. And then you go to them and try to explain to them why you're taking the position or the positions you do take if there's not enough time to have your town meeting yeah. first is uh, consistent with what you said you would do. But I would reorganize it starting right there and, and demanding that legislation be directed, focused, single subject, and detailed. Wouldn't that tie into the Tenth Amendment uh, as, as providing a corridor for a subject? In other words, the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution says that uh, those things that are not specified by the Constitution are left to the, to the states or to the people. Yes. So uh, the federal government has a tendency to, uh, to go beyond those limits and actually uh, pass laws that are not uh, provided for in the Constitution. Now, wouldn't that have an effect in the solution process? In other words, we, if we could encourage our, our leaders to follow the Constitution, wouldn't that in, in itself have a tendency to correct much of the problems that we're facing? Uh, I would uh, agree what, what you're referring to is the use of the Commerce Clause uh, and other uh, provisions uh, within the Constitution where the federal government through leg the legislative process and the executive uh, branches writing of rules and regulations including in my opinion executive orders from the president that uh, may well uh, not always comply with the Constitution what they've done is they've ex over a period of years and this has been going on at least 50 years and I've been here that period of time and longer so I've watched it have been going uh, down a road to expand and expand and expand and where I believe and of course remember now these are two different visions I believe in the vision of bringing that back and bringing it back consistent with the Tenth Amendment. Okay, that's, <laughs> well, we certainly agree on that. Yes. Uh, how can the uh, public obtain more information regarding these issues? These issues are so important and it'd be good to have a source that uh, they could turn to that would be accurate and honest. Well, uh, on the, all the numbers, the Congressional Budget Office is bipartisan and does a very good job. I would get online and subscribe to their data. I, the talk that I gave, I did a PowerPoint presentation. I had a lot of their data up. Yeah. It is very good. Uh, for those who want to look at um, uh, some conservative data, and I did, and incidentally, they were not far removed from each other, was the Heritage Foundation. They have a lot of, of good data, and uh, I'm sure there are equally good sources coming from what might be considered more the liberal side, where you can go there is you know, some of the colleges and universities uh, that are really active in political science. Uh, Wall Street Journal is another good source. The New York Times is another good source. I read a lot of, of literature and try to stay up with what's uh, going on. And between them all and between various media uh, that you can uh, look at, uh, you can pick up on what's going on and get the details. So, so there, is, there is hope. Yes, there is hope. If people will pay attention, the real problem is you don't want to be an under-informed voter. And the only way to be an informed voter is to pay attention, read, go to these sources, and listen to what they say, and, and compare them. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Guy, for your, Guy Puccio, for your interesting comments, opinions, and recommendations. And thank you for watching our program. We invite you to visit our website, which is calaverastaxpayers.org. And we hope that you'll be able to uh, uh, enjoy our program in, in the future. This is, a, this is number uh, eight of, uh, uh, that we've done, and we hope to do many more. Thank you again for watching the Calaveras uh, Taxpayer Alert. Best wishes.